What's up, everyone? Welcome to a special Campus Forum PAS Report podcast episode. This is your host, Nick Giordano. I'm glad you could join me. Before I bring on the guest, make sure that you follow and subscribe to Campus Forum and the PAS Report. Visit the websites, campusforum.org, pasreport.com. I have a great guest coming on today. I have Campus Forum Higher Education Fellow and Professor Adam Elwanga joining me. He's the author of Metanoia, and you're going to want to hear what he has to say. So, Adam, so glad you're on the program. We've spoken before. How are you today? Thanks for having me, Nick. I'm doing well. Always a pleasure speaking with you. I had you on the podcast before, and our conversation's great. We always get into what the problem is with academia. And the reason that I wanted to speak with you today is because you are doing a contest. So first, I want you to explain the contest, and then we'll talk about why you felt this contest was necessary. So can you explain the contents, uh, contest for the audience? Sure. Um, as a part of uh, my work with the Peerless Review, which is a, a online publication for uh, dissident scholarship in the humanities and social sciences, <clears throat> um, we're running a, a, a contest where you can prove me a plagiarist. Um, there's a thousand dollars worth of cash prizes up for grabs. Um, and for every documented instance of plagiarism that you can find in my work, that includes my scholarly work in peer reviewed journals and any other sort of public published writing over the last 15 years, for each documented incident of plagiarism, I'll give away a hundred dollars up to 10. And when 10 are claimed, the contest ends. I think the deadline is February 6th, and at this point, we have uh, zero accusations. Um, so uh, the money's all still there. It's, I'll, I'll hold on to it till somebody claims it. All right. So zero accusations. And we're talking about, you know, when it comes to colleges and academia, plagiarism is like one of the cardinal sins. So what gave you the idea that you felt it was necessary to do this contest? Well, anybody who's been paying close attention to higher education in the past few months uh, has observed what happened with Claudine Gay at Harvard University. Um, Chris Rufo and some other journalists uh, documented repeated instances of plagiarism in her work. Um, over a course of years, uh, you know, in different peer reviewed articles, not all in one place, but this is a pattern that was established. Um, and what really bothered me was that many of Gay's defenders were saying, this isn't this isn't a big deal. This is common practice. Everybody does that. Um, and I think that that is a, a smear. Um, of well, others. And the defenders, I want to make clear, other professors were coming out and defending her, saying it wasn't a big deal. Absolutely. Right. And I, I think when they say everybody does this, it's it's common practice. Right. Um, it's a smear of the hardworking scholars uh, who, ha, you know, have worked hard to observe what everybody knows are the rules regarding plagiarism and documentation of sources. Um, we've documented that Claudine Gay's administration held students accountable for less flagrant violations of the rules than she herself committed. Um, and I think the, the contest is is a way uh, to prove that, no, it's not common practice. Um, another argument that some professors are making was that these were just mistakes. These were just slip ups <laughs> of hers. Um, and the contest gives an opportunity to maybe prove that because I've got over a half a million words in print in some form. Uh, you would think if if these kind of mistakes are possible, right, that you would find at least one instance somewhere in a half a million words that I wrote. So it's an opportunity for participants in the contest to prove me wrong, right? Maybe I did make a mistake. Um, and on top of that, I'll say one more thing, right? Uh, it's, it's an honor to have your work uh, be scrutinized by other people, that people take the time to look at your work at all is an honor. And so, you know, when people find errors of the sort that were found in Gay's work, the proper response is not finger pointing and accusations. The proper response is, thank you for pointing this out, right? I want to reward participants in the contest if they can show me where I violated any of the standard rules for citation and documentation. Now, if it comes to your students and you catch one of your students plagiarizing, 
Now, when I say plagiarism, I'm talking about lifting a paragraph or, or something like that. What would you do to that student? Uh, well, the first thing I do is I usually give them an opportunity to own up to it. And I usually do that by emailing them and saying, hey, would you please send me all the sources that you used for this paper? And the that nicer provides, than I am. <laughs> that, that provides an out for the student where, you know, they can, if they're smart, they can figure out, all right, the jig is up. Right. And then just send me the paper, say, hey, you know, I, I didn't I forgot to document this one source. Right. And then we can have a talk about plagiarism and depending on the severity, you know, determine the punishment. But in the event that they don't pick up on what I'm trying to do and give them an out, then, which is probably 90 uh, percent of them. Yes, that's right. Uh, at, uh, at that point, you know, I, I will have a talk with them. And usually I'm I can fail them for the course, but I'm nastier than that. Here's what I do. I give them a zero on the assignment and tell them, but you can stay in the course. Um, and what that does is ensures that even though they're probably going to fail the course because they received received a zero on assignment, they also get the extra time in working to make it uh, more likely that they will pass the course on their next attempt. Um, yeah, well, I mean, listen, I have obviously plenty of students over the years, and when I hand out the research paper assignments, I'm constantly warning them that you can't plagiarize, that you can't take someone else's idea. Even if you're not directly quoting it, you still have to cite that idea. And listen, I mean, I, I tell my students, you have to do citations. It's amazing to me that they don't teach how to actually correctly cite information in the K through 12 system. That's disgraceful in and of itself. But here we're talking about a college president, someone who should be held at least to the same standards of the students, but I would argue that they should be held to higher standards than the student body, where if we're talking about someone getting caught at Harvard University plagiarizing, it could land them in an academic disciplinary hearing. They could face suspension, expulsion, depending on how many instances and what the severity was. Yet here we have a bunch of academics that came out to defend her. Not only that, she stepped down from the position of president. She still gets to go back into the classroom. So how can Pudding Gay be able to go back in the classroom and if her students plagiarize, penalize them for doing exactly what she did? Well, it's unconscionable. I mean, and, and it's even more severe than you noted. Not only does she get to go back to the classroom, she keeps her salary as president of Harvard. That's uh, almost so nine hundred thousand dollars, correct? That's that's right. That's um, close to your salary, right? <laughs> <laughs> In another universe, maybe. Um, <laughs> right? uh, yeah, I, I I think it's unconscionable. And what it does is it, it's really exposing just the rot in the institutions um, and the corruption of them. Uh, I think that one really great thing about this is that rather than start with kind of, um, you know, lower profile academics, in this attempt to demonstrate the rot, Rufo and, and the other journalists who work with him went to the tippy top, right? The, the premier um, institution in higher education in the United States, arguably in the world, right? And not only that, they didn't go to that institution. They went to the top of that institution, right? And if we're seeing this kind of stuff at that level, it's true that we've got a problem throughout all the institutions, right? Now, I don't think that everybody's doing it, right? But I do think that people are looking the other way when some people are doing it. And part of what's going on here um, is the DEI stuff, um, you know, uh, and and uh, sort of hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. I think that, that there's failures, too many failures at every level here. It's not just Claudine Gay. It's the editors of the journals that she submitted those papers to either didn't pick up on it or looked the other way. It's the peer reviewers who either didn't pick up on it or looked the other way. And it's Gay's own colleagues when they awarded her tenure, right, who, when they reviewed her entire body of published work, either didn't pick up on it or looked the other way. And so what we're seeing is multiple failures at gatekeeping junctures, right? And precisely the purpose of peer review is to serve as a gatekeeping function, or so they tell us, right? That why we do peer review is to ensure that only quality research only good research gets in the journals. Here we're seeing a case of 
routine plagiarism with somehow making it through every one of these checkpoints. This is why I started the Peerless Review. Um, I, I believe that we can publish quality academic work without the corrupted system of peer review. Um, and, and the gay incident has proven just how corrupted that system has become. It certainly has. And when you look at it, as you said, it goes through multiple hands. It's not like it's just, you know, I'm putting this on a blog and I just throw it up there. This is going, multiple people reading these things, they're having committee meetings over whether or not it should be published. They discuss the pieces. And it's very difficult to to get in these academic journals unless you subscribe to the groupthink mentality. I mean, if you, if you write based on what the editor's political leanings are and ideological leanings, then the odds are you'll get published. And I think that this is a good case of that. But even more importantly, and I think it's something that hasn't really been reported. We reported at our campus reform, but you didn't really see it in the news. And I could understand that the news uh, media isn't going to focus on it too much. But last year alone, 2023, over 10,000 academic articles and research works had to be retracted from the scholarly journals for plagiarism issue, for faulty research, for uh, manipulation. What does that say about the entire academic profession? Well, it, it, it shows that much of what's going on is, is fraudulent. Um, I think that we've we've got a, a screwed up system of promotion and tenure too, which incentivizes. I mean, most people have heard about publish or perish. If you tell somebody you must publish six articles in six years, or else you're losing your job, right? Then they're gonna crank out something, right? It, it's not necessarily going to be quality research, and like you said, a lot of it is kind of um, very, very incestuous. It's if you're on board with kind of the pieties of secular woke leftism, right, and that's reflected in your work, then you'll find an outlet for it. But it's not because you wrote a, a compelling piece of research. It's because you're you're on the right team, right? So they'll push it forward. Um, I think that uh, this is, uh, you know, it's it's terrible. But the 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 journals now kind of have the same paper written over and over and over. They all say the same thing. It's just uh, in that sense, like the entire body of scholarship over, especially the last three years, is plagiarized because it's like they're all writing the same systemic racism paper in a million different ways. Um, there's very little original research that's that's going on. And the, the stuff that is original is a virtually unrecognizable to peer reviewers now because they see so little of it. Now, obviously, only time will tell. But do you think that there's many at these uh, journals that are coming to a reflection to see that the system is broken, the process is broken, that they failed and that they need to reform to make sure that only true scholarship actually gets into these journals? Or do you think that since it didn't receive so much attention and coverage that we'll see the same old, same old? I don't think it can be reformed and I'll tell you why. It's because there's a whole other level of incestuous behavior here. Here's how it works. The government provides research funds, assigns those, that funding to researchers who will produce the results that they were really getting paid to produce, that research goes into the peer-reviewed journals. And the, the true function of the peer-reviewed journals these days is to serve as sort of media evidence, right? Um, where, well, peer-reviewed journals all say this, and so this must be true. And so it's really sort of a triangular uh, sort of thing of corruption between government, media, and academia that they're all kind of working to align the narrative. Um, and that's really the ideological function of the journals now is just to provide a prestige uh, veneer for the right opinions. And I don't think that the government or the media is real eager to give up on that. So the journals won't be reformed. But there are alternatives. Um, my my journal, peerlessreview.org, is one. Uh, there is also researchers one researchers.one, which is publishing quality research without the peer review process online. Um, so I think that the days of the peer reviewed print journal are almost over. And what we'll see is a new uh, system of academic publication arise. 
let's hope that's the case. I mean, Eisenhower did warn uh, about the grant funding to fund the nation's research and, and the national scholars will be beholden to that government funding. And it's true. I mean, if I wanted to write a research uh, article on limited government, well, getting a government grant for that would be very difficult. If I wanted to write a, an article regarding domestic terrorism and white supremacy, I guarantee you I'll get the grant relatively quickly. And it shows you the corruption within the system. What do you foresee for higher education going forward? I mean, higher education's in trouble. They, they've shown themselves that it's not really about academics, uh, scholarship. It's not about merit anymore. It's all about this uh, DEI ideology. It's all about towing a political line and political activism. We're seeing enrollment drop. We're seeing corporations reconsider four-year degrees uh, requirements for positions. We're seeing small businesses move away from college degrees, states moving away from college degrees. What do you think is on the horizon for higher education in, in the next you know, three to five years and 10 years out? Do you think that it's a system that's going to collapse on, on itself and be reborn in another form? Or, or do you think that this is a system that will continue to chug along despite how corrupt it is? Hard to say. It's very difficult. I, I, I don't think that we'll see any kind of collapse before 10 years. Um, I think that the, the existing system is, uh, in, in some sense, too big to fail. I mean, if you think about how much space in this country is devoted to college campuses, how much that real estate is valued with as many buildings as there are, and to allow the bottom to fall out on the whole enterprise sort of begs the question of, well, what would happen to these places? What would happen to, you know, the whole, uh, you know, system of academic labor? Um, that said, and the I towns do, and communities that it supports. That's right. And but I do think that America's confidence in a higher education as an institution has significantly waned. Um, I think young men especially are uh, turning away from the four year college route. And I think that's and a good thing. Can you explain thing. why that is? I think that's such an important point that you just made. So just can you take a second and explain it to the audience? Yeah, well, one of uh, one of the reasons that I think young men are turning away is they're rightly realizing that they can get very lucrative employment without a college degree, uh, whether that's in the trades or or other areas. I mean, um, you know, my my cousin, who is a plumber, uh, makes ten thousand dollars more a year than I do. Uh, I have a Ph.D. I'm a full professor tenured at a university and a plumber makes more than I do. Right. And he's not paying student loan debts. Um, but the second reason that young men are turning away is because the the system of higher education, the culture of higher education has become quite feminized um, and sort of masculine virtues that uh, that, you know, men want to see uh, be rewarded for are not rewarded. Right. That that culture of contestation. Um, and and uh, uh, agonism that sort of young men excel at is is highly discouraged in these environments. Um, and once you add in all the therapeutic elements of sort of the softness of the institutional rhetoric, DEI, sensitivity training, all this stuff, it sort of runs counter to many of the impulses that young men uh, feel, and it, and it runs counter to their strength. And I think that they are uh, beginning to wake up to that. Um, but as they leave the institution, the institution will become more and more feminized as uh, female students outnumber the male ones. Um, so it's kind of in a, in a spiral of decline. Um, I don't know. Do you think there's other reasons why men are staying away? Well, when you're bombarded with messaging of how toxic you are just for simply being a male and maybe being a white male, I, I think there, I know for myself, I won't want to pay tens of thousands of dollars to hear that I'm a horrible human being or something <laughs> that's completely out of my control. So I, I think that is a large reason and for the reasons that you stated. And it is important, though, that we have a higher education system. I mean, let's be honest here. Higher education is the hallmark of a nation's greatness. It depends on whether or not a civilization is going to advance 
or it, it's going to stay in the third world, maybe getting to developing status, but that's about it. Uh, unfortunately, our higher education decline is well noted, including in the international rankings. And so to me, it signifies a decline of our nation and our nation's power overall. So we either reverse the trend or we continue down the spiral that you're talking about. I think at it, it bottom, you know, Alan Bloom talked in his famous book, The Closing of the American Mind, about how the university is supposed to be an elite institution in a democratic society, right? I think that what we're seeing is that our elite institutions can no longer countenance the idea of an elite institution. And so they're trying to democratize an institution that only functions when it has sort of elite values. Um, and so what we get is like, why shouldn't, you know, a third rate graduate student rise up to be president of Harvard? You know, why, why shouldn't, we have open admissions uh, for for campuses. Um, why shouldn't there be free education for all? Um, if you democratize the institution, which depends on elite values, you're ruining it. And that's what we're seeing unfolding in real time. Uh, I think that's a spot on analysis right there. Adam, I really enjoyed the conversation. Definitely want to have, have you back to keep it going. I want to thank you for joining me today, Adam. Thanks so much. It was great.